Good morning, everybody. Good to see you today. So glad you're here. Met a couple of you coming in that were first timers, and uh, we're always glad to have you. Hope that you just enjoy your experience and kick back and worship with us. The only favor we ask is if you don't mind, if you've not yet done that, fill out that little communication card and let us know uh, who you are so we can just follow up and thank you for being here today. But we can answer questions at the tent. And out there, thank you. My name's Randy. I'm so glad that you're viewing today and worshiping along with us. You may want to grab your Bible or turn your device on to Genesis. We continue in a series in Joseph, the um, son of Jacob. Because as we've said a couple of times, when you study Joseph, you're really studying the whole family. Because there's a lot of the dynamic, both good and bad, going on in this family for three generations. And it's good to take that into account as we go through the life and the trials of Joseph. All of you by now probably are old enough to have had an experience that was not favorable. It was an injustice. It was a betrayal. It was a rejection. And those things tend to stay with us. Even more so when it happens within the family unit. Someone that you've grown up with, someone that you're closest to at points, when he or she is the one perpetrating it, it's so much harder. And it's so much more long-lasting. What we do with this, how we process this, is going to greatly shape who we are and how well we conduct our lives in the days to come. And the reminder here many Sundays is there's always someone watching us too. In many cases, it's the younger generation. It may be our own children. But today, if you'll turn to chapter 42 of Genesis, we'll talk a little bit about that because we all have choices to make. Today, the point that Joseph's going to teach us about, and others also in the Bible have done a great job of this, he chooses grace over grudges. He's got every reason in the world to be bitter, to be angry, to be vindictive, and we don't see that by this point in chapter 42 of, of Genesis. He has chosen to exercise grace toward those who hurt him the most and toward those who abused him in some way, shape, or another. Romans 12, 21, that's on your screen, says basically that from Paul. Don't return evil with evil, but choose to return evil with good. And that's where we are today. We're, when we left off last week, Joseph had made that, that swoop from the prison to the palace where he is pulled out of prison and he's standing before Pharaoh in the twinkling of an eye. Pharaoh says, I've had a dream. He breaks the dream down for him. He interprets it. It's going to be seven bumper crop years, great years. We better store up some of that each year so we'll have storehouses to feed our country as well as others who come knocking on our borders and that's exactly what they do he puts him in charge he says other than me you're gonna, you are the most powerful man in the whole country what we believe we're going to read now is maybe two three years into the famine it's been long enough to start taking the toll now on the people and there's some suffering that is going on and this will bring this family part of this family back together for the first time. And what Joseph does next is going to be very revealing. Because has he chosen a grudge or has he chosen grace? Let's pray. Father, we need you as usual today to help us interpret your word in a way that not only honors the truth of it, but it helps us to change our lives. Lord, um, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be with my brothers and sisters here and to celebrate the redemption and the life that you've given us through Christ. Lord, in light of that, would you open our hearts and minds and help us to make next step decisions spiritually that you are authoring. So please come, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Got your Bible out? Let's read chapter 42, verses 1 through 4, and kind of get a flavor. I'm not going to read the whole chapter as usual, but we'll hit some highlights and talk about having the right perspective. We're going to talk about the perspective on ourselves, our 
perspective on God and our perspective on grief itself when those things happen. So let's read verses 1 through 4. It's end of the famine. When Jacob, who was Joseph's dad, learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? I don't know why. That, for, to me, that's just funny. He comes in. They, here's these. I, I picture all these young men, and they're kind of sitting around doing, you know, like, well, it's really hot out there, isn't it? It's really dry around here. And Jacob's had enough. It's like, I've been waiting on y'all to understand that we're in a crisis and you're not. So why do you keep looking at each other? Let's do something about it. They said in verse 2, we thought this was due to global warming. That's <laughs> not in the Bible. I'm just kidding. Just making sure you're, you're reading along with me, okay? He continued, I have heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down here and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. It's critical. Verse 3, then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. He sends 10 of them. He holds Benjamin, the youngest, back. Benjamin and Joseph were full brothers from the same mom who happened to be Jacob's favorite wife out of four. Joseph happened to be his favorite son out of the 12 Benjamin was the last, and so he's a precious boy, too, to him. That's not the model for the most healthy marriage or family. But that was the reality as we come to this point. So these ten set out for a long, long hike to go from the Canaan region down to Egypt. So let's talk about our perspective on ourselves when we are challenged or when we will, as we say today, under pressure. When the pressure comes, how do we deal with this? This is basically verses 6 through 17 in the text of today's chapter. The brothers go down, and we get an indication that Joseph was so in charge of this that you pretty much had to come to his desk to be approved for grain if you were coming in from somewhere else especially, and that's what happened. These ten brothers come into the room where their brother Joseph is seated. He recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. Because remember, he's dressed and looks for all the world like an Egyptian. He speaks the language of Egypt. Everything in him is the appearance of Egyptian and not Hebrew. But he recognizes them and what's going on. So he decides in the spur of the moment to test them. And he accuses them of being spies. And they immediately start backing up and say, oh, no, we're not spies. I love verse 11 because they immediately say, oh, no, we're honest men. We're honest men. And I'm like, well, not really. But we'll go with that here. They're not spies. We'll agree with that. And, he's just, and he decides, I'm not going to back down from it. He continues to accuse them of being spies. They start to just spew all the information about their family they can to convince him that they're not spies. Hey, we have a father back home. He sent us here. He sent all of us except one. Well, matter of fact, there's one that is, at, in their terms, there is, he is no more. Like, we don't know if he's alive or dead, but he's presumed to be dead. And then we have a younger one. He's back home. And Joseph all the time is saying, oh, wow. Great. Everybody's still intact. My dad's still living. He gets information he needs. But his next response is, well, I still think you're spies. I'm going to throw, throw all of you in prison. And one of you can go all the way back home and bring this other one I've not met yet back. That will be proof that you're not spies. I guess if you're not into that, you'll just rot here in prison. And he puts them in jail for three days just to let them worry about it and to let them fret about this. Now, it could have been much worse. I said earlier this might have been the biggest test of Joseph's character. We believe that he's somewhere in the 22 or 23 years since he was separated from his family. At 17, you change a lot from 17 to 30-something. 
And they don't recognize him, but he sees them coming. And he decides to not exact vengeance and not make them pay for the terrible thing they did to him, but he is going to test them. He's trying to find out, have they grown up? Have they matured? Are they still the lying, cheating, conniving siblings that they always were? And so he has a plan behind this. You've got to have the right perspective on yourself, y'all, to walk into. If, if, can you imagine any room that you walk into, you are automatically the most powerful person in that room? That's where he is suddenly. He has no experience being that, but he is. And he's going to handle it very gracefully. Because here's one reason. If you've heard from God and you know you have a relationship, but furthermore, you have a mission from God, you have a purpose for being who you are and doing what you're doing, that will motivate you beyond any um, abuse you get or, or anything else that people do wrong to you. Any mistreatment that comes your way, you won't necessarily like it, but you will continue to live toward that mission that he's given you. Joseph had that. He knew God. He knew God periodically in the revelation of dreams, either his or other people. And in every step of the way, he's confronted with this God who comes into misfortune with a dream to remind him, I'm not only here, I'm working in your life and I'm planning stuff for you and I'm preparing you for that now and he gets it he's old enough and mature enough to understand that so he has he's operating of a perspective of this is really not about me this is about maybe a bunch of other people and he starts to see it because I'm here and God's given me the intellect to do this there's no telling how many people will not die out of starvation because I am here. Maybe my own family. Notice the first thing they do is they come in and they bow before him. Ooh, remember the dream he had. The day is coming when all of you will bow. And it says later he remembered that. What about the brothers? What's their perspective? Guilt. We'll see it in a minute. minute. They immediately start turning on each other and saying, see, we're in trouble now because of what happened back there. If we hadn't done that to our brother, now it's been two decades. It's been over 20 years since that's happened. They're still dragging around the anvil of the guilt of their decisions about their brother. And that is influencing everything they see and everything they see. We're going to see them start blaming each other and turning on each other. And that's probably part of what Joseph was looking for. Because as they're having this conversation in front of him, he's speaking through an interpreter, so they believe he can't understand, but he's listening to every word that's coming out of their mouth. And it's giving him the information he needs. So what do we do with this perspective on self? Everything that happens to us, whether it's good or bad, is a test for us too. It's a test of character. It's a test of faith. It's a test of trust. Joseph has learned how to trust God through the worst, and in the best, he's learned how to trust people that are working with him or in his life. The brothers who are older than him have not learned either one, apparently. They're still trying to figure out life as they go while dragging around the guilt that they were not made to bear forever. Adversity gives me and you a good dose of reality, but it also helps us to handle the adversity, I believe, in a better way. There's stuff that's happened to you and happened to me that I'll probably go to my grave never fully understanding why that had to happen. I can put my own solutions to it. And those that maybe were perpetrators of a, of a bad thing, I can hold them accountable and I can have a bitterness toward them or an ill will toward them forever. Or I can exercise grace and let that go. 
because what I do will choose my future. And it will in part choose how successful I am in whatever God's mission. One of the sad things of being a pastor is I run across people on a weekly basis who are good people and they love God, but... There is this little something in them that could not let go, could not forgive, and now they take that into every relationship that they are in, and there's a little bit of yeah, but, yeah, but, I'm not sure, and all that is 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 their statement of trust. I'm not sure I can trust you because I'm not sure since that happened I fully can trust God. And it's not a healthy place. We've got to choose between the two. The second thing is we have this perspective on God when the pressure um, gets, gets greater. Um, let's look at verses 18 through 28. If you scan that while I'm talking, uh, he keeps them for three days. And then at first he says, I'm going to keep everybody but one. I'm going to send one back. You can bring your brother back. He changes that and he keeps Simeon. He keeps one and he sends the rest of them back. He gives his servant sort of a secret instruction to they're, they're, give them enough grain to hold them for a good while so they'll have these sacks of grain. But they came to buy it with silver. They were all, all the people who came into Egypt to buy the grain were paying for it, and Egypt was getting very prosperous because of this. So they come in with silver, and he says, put all their silver back in their, in, with their grain in those sacks and don't tell them. So they get halfway home, and one of them opens up his sack, and and he doesn't interpret it in a good way. It's like, oh, hallelujah, he was really generous. He gave us it. That's not at all on their mind. They're like, oh, no, we're dead now. We're in big trouble now. He's going to kill us. He gonna... Now we're not only spies to him, but we're thieves. And so then they head back with that, with that type of... Um, with that type of attitude. So what's Joseph's perspective on God? I believe by this point in his life, he approaches God with a sense of fear and reverence. Fear means deep respect. It doesn't mean the fear, fear of he's going he's gonna to get me. Um, it's the reverence that says I would, kind of like you have for a grandparent, last thing in the world I would want to do is disappoint my grandmother and do something stupid that would just break her heart. That's that type of relationship that a worship relationship with God is all about. That's how it's defined as fear. It's a reverence. It is a respect. He has learned to do that, and he's learned to trust God through that because we said earlier, like in week one, whether it's the greatest place in the world or the worst place, Joseph spends every day like he fully believes that the presence of God is right there with him. And the Bible says he was. God was with him there in Potiphar's house. God was with him there in the prison. And it's no less true now. God is with him here now that he's the second most powerful person in the whole nation. So he's operating out of trust. The brothers, they're operating out of shame and suspicion. Let me read a few verses to you. Let's let's look at verse 18 to give a, a smattering of that. On the third day, Joseph said... Um, do this and you will live for I fear God. Look at verse 21. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That is why this distress has come on to us. The shame is causing him to interpret things in light of that. Verse 22, Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Now they're blaming each other. If you hadn't thrown him in that cistern, we'd be a lot better. Reuben's the oldest, so he's, he's going to take charge of that. Look down at verse 28 when they found out about the silver. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other, trembling, and said, What is this that God has done to us? Oh, I knew he was going to get us. And here it is. Verse 36. When they get home, their father Jacob said, You have deprived me of all my children. Joseph is no more. 
Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Now notice that last sentence. Everything is against me. There's his perspective on God. God is a God of scarcity. He's not a giving God. He's taking, he took my son, he's taken another son. If I let Benjamin go, I'll never see him again. He will take him away from me too. He says later, my gray hair will come down in sorrow. It appears to me that this is a man that 22, 23 years ago, his life was taken from him when Joseph disappeared. And he's not truly been living since then. We'll talk about that more in a minute. These sons, by evidence of what they feel about the money that has come their way, they're suspicious of everything. There is no trust. When you're not a trusting person, you're going to be a suspicious person. Even the good gifts, sometimes even the good gifts that come from God are questioned. And rather than used and enjoyed, they're held in and not celebrated. And God's point is that's not how we're supposed to live. Can I give you some more good news? God cannot change, nor will he fail. You can always trust God to be the changeless God. If he said it there, it applies today. If he did this back there, he will do it again today if it's consistent with who he is as God. And he will not fail. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. If we do our part and we stay obedient to him, we stay in relationship with him, he will not fail to do that. And that's his lifelong promise to Joseph. Because up until this point, more than half of his life has been spent going in the opposite direction. David could relate to it. David gets anointed as king as a teenager. Thirteen years later, he's still running and hiding out in caves and running for his life because the present king is not only still living, he's decided he's got to go, I'm going to kill him, and he's after him with his whole army. And so part of this is what do you do in your relationship with God when you heard pretty clearly, you heard what he required of you pretty clearly, but ever since you got on board with it, your life has fallen apart. The tendency is to say, well, I guess I didn't hear from him there because he wouldn't do that. No, 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 no. Sometimes that's exactly what needs to happen. Not because he's a punishing, evil, cruel God, but because he is preparing us for something much better. But as we've said, he will not give you more than your character will handle. Lamentations 3, 32 and 33, that's verses you might want to look at real quick or write them down for later, because that's so good, um, what he says there, Lamentations 3, the writer Jeremiah says, though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of God. When it happens, he, he suffers with us. He grieves with us. He's disappointed with us. He feels wronged when you do, and it's not that he wants that to happen. He allows it if it serves the greater good. And many of you, like I could, could get up here and testify, you know, I learned the most about myself, and I learned the most about God when I was in those dark days, when there was trouble, when there was a struggle, when there was affliction. That's when we're most open many times to what God wants to tell us or show us or, or prove to us. What he's been doing in Joseph's life all this way, and there's been a process, is he's teaching them when you're going to push a button, push the grace button and let it go over the grudge. He's in a position now to do something about it if he wants to. He could do anything he wanted to to those ten brothers of his. 
And so far, he's not. So far, he's not. So let's talk about the third. We gain a perspective on ourselves and God, but what about grief? Grief is a dynamic that has and will continue to affect 100% of the people in this room. It's going to and is affecting 100% of all of you folks out there. It is a part of life. Any significant loss is going to be grieved. So in verse 29 through 38, they, they get home and they tell dad, basically, you know, that man back in Egypt, he was mean to us. He kept Simeon and he threw us in jail. We didn't do nothing wrong. And when he let us out, he said that we couldn't come back to get more grain without Benjamin. And so we're going to need to take him back. And, oh, not only has he gotten his silver back, all of us discovered, uh-oh, our money is in our sacks. So now when we go back, probably, we're not only going to be spies, but we're going to be thieves, and he might. But the only way we're ever going to see Simeon, you're going to see Simeon, your son again, is if we take Benjamin and we're able to broker a deal with him. And so you know what dad does? Nothing. He doesn't deal with it. The same way he did not deal with incest in his family, murder in his family, a variety of other things, he does nothing. Maybe if I pretend it didn't happen, it will go away and Simeon will magically show back up at my house. And maybe... This grain will just magically spread and multiply to where we can last out the famine until the next crop season. But we're gonna, as we're going to see next week, he's going to have to make a decision whether to give up his children again in hopes that he gets them all back or to give them up and not get them back. So let's get a flavor of this grief. Look at verse, I read verse 36 where he said, everything is against me. Uh, Reuben speaks up then. Reuben, one of the sons, um, the oldest, speaks up and he says, look, this is desperate. You can't, you can't just ignore it. You're going to have to make a decision here. If you'll let Benjamin go with us, I'll be responsible for him to the point that if something happens to him, you can choke out my two sons. Now, how, what kind of logic is that? What a great plan was that? In other words, you can kill your two grandchildren if I don't come back like, like he's going to do that. Of course he's not going to do that. Reuben is trying, though, to be trustworthy when he's not been trustworthy most of his life. And he said, hey, you know, I'll let him do that. Joseph, you think Joseph's grieving? Yes, Joseph is still grieving here. Because in verse 24, it says at one point, it's so emotional to him, and we'll see it next Sunday, it's so emotional to him, he has to excuse himself, and he goes out and weeps. This is a young man who 22, 23 years of his life has been robbed from him, and his time with his family has been robbed from him, and he's still grieving about it. And he should be still grieving about it. That's a normal thing. But there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. It looks like he's doing it the right way because of how he responds when these boys do, do show up. Because he is a man who trusts God and his mission for him more than the mistreatment that he has had. I uh, read a story about Calvin Coolidge, one of our former presidents. Calvin Coolidge came to the presidency suddenly. He was the VP and the president who was Harrison. William Harrison died suddenly and they woke Coolidge up in the middle of the night to tell him, hey, President Harrison is dead. That means you are now the president. And he said, thank you very much. There's nothing I can do about it right now. And he went back to bed. <laughs> He was, he was known as maybe one of the most introverted presidents we've ever had. They called him Silent Calvin because he just didn't say anything. Unlike the many words at the debate the other night, that was not Calvin Coolidge. But then what made it even more so, not too long after that, his 16-year-old son died. 
and he went within. He went underground. And you could not break through that shell. And his staff spent a lot of time wondering what he was even thinking, let alone going to do. He didn't bring anybody into that circle. Not long after that, he's walking out on the lawn of the White House, and there's a 13-year-old boy looking through the gate, and the 13-year-old boy yelled at him, and he said, President Coolidge, I'm just sorry that your boy died. I'm sorry. And Coolidge stops and says, show him in. And he takes him back to his office, and he spent an hour with the 13-year-old boy. And at the end of the hour, Coolidge told his advisors, if he shows back up, show him in any time. And it happened again two or three times. And so what the summation was, was he saw this 13-year-old boy as safe. And when you're the president, there's a lot of people around you that are not safe. But this man needed to grieve like we all do. And in unpacking his grief, he could do it to a safe 13-year-old adolescent. And he started to get better. And he started to be more of a president. What about these brothers? They're living in grief, but it has turned to remorse. And it has turned to regret for what they did to their father, for what they did to their brother. And there's nothing in their arsenal to do with it. They don't know how to process it. They've not taken it to God, evidently. They've not confided, confided fully into each other other than to blame each other and to share the shame of all of that. And so when the money starts to show up, they can't accept it. It's part of their punishment, they believe, from this God who's going to get them and judge them. So what about Jacob? Jacob is still mired up in his grief, which believes that everything, even the good gifts, have a string attached. And every suspect thing that happens to me is just adding on to my grief because everything is against me. And so he's really not lived in a long time because as we closed out last week, we talked about joy as the secret of dealing with adversity and finding the holiness of God in the middle of trouble. He has none. So he is certainly held hostage to whatever the situation brings today. If it's good, he's okay. If it's negative, he falls apart. And his, his de facto way of dealing with it, his defense mechanism was, I just won't deal with it. I'll just act like it did not happen. So can I remind you as we get ready to close out, remind you of one more statement. Following Jesus is never safe. There's always a risk involved. That's how life is. We're not shielded from life because we're a Christ follower. We don't get a pass from adversity because we're good guys. We face it, and sometimes we face it even harder. But again, we've been given the arsenal to deal with it. We've been given some arrows in our quiver. One is the joy of the Lord, which is like on the bad days as well as the good days. We know how the story is going to end up, right? We know how this will end, and we're okay because we know our reward is in heaven. So we'll deal with it today, and we'll experience the emotions and the hurt, but not as if someone who has no hope because we have the joy of Christ in us. We also will be resilient enough to know today was bad, today stunk, but tomorrow's coming. And tomorrow, I'm going to adjust my life to the reality of whatever. Some of y'all have been All-American, first-team All-Americans at this, where health has been taken away, retirement has taken away a lot of good things that you enjoyed so much, certain things happen, can't do anything about it, but you adjust your life to the reality of it. You call it what it is, but you have Christ still. You keep following Christ in view of the new reality. That's a good place to be. It's a good
good place to be. And what I love about this place and what I love about healthy churches in general is we have a fellowship of suffering. The church is never better than when a crisis hits and we rally around somebody. Oh, that's why we kind of gently push you toward groups, life groups, because that's where you celebrate the wins. That's where you mourn the losses. That's where you grief the deaths in your families. And it needs to be that way. It needs to be that way. Those, um, those 11 remaining disciples on that Sunday night after the crucifixion, that Friday, why are they all huddled up in that upper room, the 11 of them? There's a lot going on, I'm sure, but I'll guarantee you one thing they were doing, they were fellowshipping in their sufferings. They're grieving together. Jesus was dead or so they thought. So they thought. So you see yourself more like Joseph at this point or like his brothers. Thomas Akempis in 1447 wrote this, Neither talents nor wealth, neither wit nor eloquence have any value in thy sight, O Lord, without grace. We're going to choose between grace or grudges. It's our choice, and God will let us make that choice. But you know as well as I know, that will influence our days ahead, and that will influence how well we do in the kingdom of God. There is one, his name was Jesus, who took to the cross and who put up with a lot of suffering and a lot of mistreatment and a lot of abuse just because of his grace that he's poured into us. And because of him... We have the opportunity to walk in that grace and to let things in the past stay in the past and keep moving forward to what he has for us. And so we get to worship here in song one more time. And I'm going to just, this is that time I invite you to come forward. If you'd like to have prayer, if you'd like to celebrate a key decision that you've made, we'd love for you to do that. Would you stand and let me pray for you? Lord, we, we don't see very well into the future. Uh, we know you do. We leave that to you. Um, we know that your grace allows us to trust you more as that good and wonderful and giving God. But we also know we live in a fallen world, a busted place. And there's enough bad and enough evil going around. We're going to get caught up in that. But, Lord, I'm thankful because you have modeled through Jesus the fact that we have a choice to choose grace over grudge. So help us to choose wisely. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.